Jesus said, be of good cheer. It's your Father's desire to give you the kingdom. We have such hope. Don't look at yourself. It's the fastest way to get discouraged. Keep looking at Jesus. He'll lead you to higher ground. He'll fill you with love, which is the purifying element of the relationship with Him. Nothing else can change you. It's a deep devotion to the one who knows you better than you know yourself and carried your sins already to the cross. So I'm appealing to you this evening. Remember, you're a prince and a princess in the kingdom of God if you've received Christ into your heart. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our gathering again here tonight. We thank you for the privilege of freedom, for this great country that has liberated so many to be able to choose whom and how and when they would worship. And I'm asking, Lord, tonight that we would prize that privilege perhaps like we never have before, before this night is over. So now, Lord, I pray, bless our leaders, strengthen those that govern from the local township to the President of the United States. Give them courage and grace and wisdom. And may they walk in the light. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This evening we're going to cover a fair amount of ground, hopefully not too quickly. I've entitled my message, Christian No More, America's Last Days of Probation. Now before I start, you saw I carried up a, a slew of books. Obviously, Solomon said, and uh, John testified as well in the New Testament, that to the making of books there is no end. This one says, coming apart. This one says, the road to character. This one says, the death of character. And this one is America in Retreat. I have another old one here called The Peril of the Republic, which was an, a very interesting book written about 100 years ago by a Adventist historian examining the roots of American governance against some of its imperialistic acts in the early 20th century. Tonight, I do want to say with you there is some sobriety about what I'm going to share, but I want you to remember something. The work of a prophet is to edify and to exhort and to comfort. And here's the one thing I don't want you to do. Don't hang your hook. Don't, don't hold on for the American dream. Hold on for the heavenly one. Amen? Now listen, this is not your home. The problem is America's been very, very good to all of us. And we have lived beyond the reach of so many of the world's traumas. And it's because of our laws, our constitution, and it's because of the character and culture of our nation, which is exactly what's under siege today. And we have e experienced so much opportunity and liberty that it's turned into license and we are experiencing a rotting of society and civilization and soul. And this is precisely what it has been the church's job to do and preserve. Unfortunately, the church in the last 40 years has co-opted a business model where the pastors relate to you like your customers. And of course, we know in America, customers are king. But the church was never meant to be co-opted in a business model. The church was to be a family, God's family. And pastors were to be spiritual leaders along with moms and dads. And homes were to be little churches, but instead they've turned into theaters and sometimes dens of evil. And instead of challenging people to do what's right, we've embraced the idea of making people feel good no matter what they're doing. And in the end, it isn't going to be good. So tonight, I'm appealing to you to be salt. Be the kind of people that change your workplace, change your home, make our communities great places. And by the way, I very much appreciate my, my community here in Southwest Michigan. And I value so much my church family and those of you that have gathered here tonight. We can make a difference, but you do pay a price for freedom. And I want you to understand that for a long time now, I don't think much of a price has been paid by the majority. So tonight, a few sober but 
indeed truthful journeys through the prophetic messages. Christian, no more. The Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I need you to know as I start tonight that people and nations have moments of probation when they wander away from their charter, from the mandate, from the reason for their existence. God holds groups of people accountable just as he holds individuals. Now, there is a recording angel that examines the journey of the families of the earth. In Revelation chapter 13, last night we saw that worship is a very big deal. As a matter of fact, Revelation 13 describes two beasts. I didn't tell you who the first beast was. Tonight, I'm going to explain to you who the second beast was. Now, this is slightly out of order of how one might normally do this, but before it's all said and done, I think we can make good sense of the second beast in Revelation 13. This is an artist's rendition of the first, a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. Now, if you've been noticing on our Jesus on Prophecy logo, there's a picture of Jesus holding the light, and you have these symbols around him. These are symbols that represent nations and kingdoms. This is a prophetic uh, understanding that comes as the Bible explains itself. John writing on Revelation 13 says, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Now, we saw last night that, and the previous night that metals in the dream represented kings and kingdoms. I'm going to show you tonight than animals. Now, this shouldn't be new to us. Almost every sports team has some kind of mascot that represents it, and countries do too. In the United States, if I were to flash a picture of an eagle up there holding the arrows, you would know that represents the United States. There's nothing new about this. It shouldn't surprise us. This beast had seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns. And on his heads, a blasphemous name. That gives us an understanding that this is not some far-off religious power. This is a Christian or uh, at least a religion related to Jehovah because blasphemy in the Bible relates to taking on the prerogatives and the attributes of God. The beast that he saw was an interesting conglomeration. It was a leopard in some places on the feet. Uh, actually, it was a leopard and on the feet it looked like a bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his throne and his great authority. Now, the question is, do these beasts appear anywhere else? And the answer is yes, in Daniel chapter 7. Now, Daniel chapter 7 will be the next major story or expose of prophetic history after 2. Daniel chapter 2, the metals and the dream. But Daniel's going to cover the same ground, but this time he's going to use different symbols. And in the book of Daniel, the farther you go into the book, the more the details get on the time of the end. Because when you read Daniel chapter 12, Daniel tells us that the book is about the time of the end. Now, Daniel is different than Revelation. The book of Daniel is, Daniel's told, seal up the book. Revelation is not to be sealed. But Daniel was not understood and has only had a progressive understanding through the years. Jesus understood that the abomination of desolation was something Daniel had predicted as one of his prophets. But in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to cover the same ground of uh, progression of kingdoms as we did in Daniel chapter 2, but it's going to be these, these animals. And these animals are what are going to show up again in Revelation 13, only it's a conglomeration of all these animals in Revelation 13. So Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So here we go. Those, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings. Now I'm skipping a little farther into the chapter, and I'm about to go back. So he's telling us at the end of the chapter that these beasts represent kings which arise out of the earth. And when he goes to explain it, it's not just the person, but it's the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth. So the Bible isn't making this very simple. You don't have to go to the newspaper. As a matter of fact, don't go to the tabloid magazines. Don't go to the internet to understand the Bible. Go to the rest of the Bible. It explains itself. God set it up this way. Inspired explanations for inspired mysteries. A beast equals a political power in the prophecies. 
Now, when you're reading in the regular historical narratives, a beast doesn't equal a kingdom. A beast is a beast. When you read about Balaam's donkey that wouldn't obey him and that talked to him, that doesn't represent a king or a kingdom. It's just a story. It's a historical story. But in the prophetic literature, a beast equals a kingdom. And waters equals something. The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Jesus explains this through the prophet John in the book of Revelation. So these beasts are coming up out of the peoples of the world. And what were they? Four kingdoms. Daniel chapter 2 covers these four kingdoms, and I won't spend a lot of time here, but we saw Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and divided Europe. But when we come down to the beast of Daniel chapter 7, we're going to see a lion that represents Babylon, and a bear that represents Persia, and a, and a leopard that represents Greece, and the Rome is represented by the dragon. So, the first was like a lion. He had eagle's wings. I watched until they were plucked off. It was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Interestingly enough, there can be no doubt, you can go to the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. I've been there a few times. You can go to, a, uh, an, uh, you can go to the Ishtar Gate, which was the, the palace. It was the impressive gate if you were to enter Babylon. And they have all these glazed blue bricks, and all over them are winged lions. This is a very easy symbol to find historically associated with the kingdom of Babylon. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and they said thus to it arise, devour, and eat much flesh. We should be expecting indeed that the kingdom that would follow Babylon in chapter 7 is the same kingdom that would follow Babylon in chapter 2. Medo-Persia conquered from the east, and then it went on to conquer the rest of the then-known world. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. When you see wings on something, it's a reference typically to swiftness. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, there is a reason for the four heads. This animal represents Greece. And when we look at the conquest of Alexander the Great, indeed it was a very swift and unexpected uh, victory to victory that he experienced. Why the foreheads? Because when he died suddenly at the age of 32 or 33 from alcohol poisoning, seemed he could not control his appetite, uh, he was, his kingdom was divided four ways by his four generals. And after this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. What beast followed Greece in Daniel chapter 2? What, what kingdom? Rome. And that's what we're going to see here. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It shouldn't surprise us. It is somewhat unique and different from all the other beasts. And it had ten horns. We know that Rome, in the end, was divided ten ways. There is an element that enters into prophecy called the little horn and we see a co-opting of civil power and religious power when the civil government of rome implodes there comes out of it a religious entity that will rule the world and those ten horns representing ten conquered kingdoms of western europe and we see again the progression now tonight i want to talk about the second beast of revelation chapter 13. it is a unique beast and it has unique habits. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. This beast was different than what he was used to seeing before. It had two horns and a lamb, like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. So there's kind of a riddle about this animal. It appears as something that John may have never seen before. It has two horns, but there is something conspicuously missing with this animal. The thing we first need to notice is where does this power arise? It comes up out of the earth. Now, we learned just moments ago that the sea represents peoples. In this case, the earth being the opposite of that, geologically speaking, represents a place where there is not nearly the density of population as you found in the old world where most of these kingdoms had had their focus before. So it's coming up out of a not-so-populated component of the globe. And it's a strange thing that North America should find itself so uh, largely undiscovered and 
Not that there weren't peoples here indeed. And for some of those, uh, for many of the dynamics in relating to the Native Americans that already lived here, we can sense a great sense of uh, regret for some of the way they were treated. But largely speaking, this was an unpopulated nation. When does this power arise? Now, this becomes a little bit, this becomes a little bit uh, where the two topics are tied together in such a way that I need you to kind of take my word on this until I get to it farther into the seminar. But when we see the medieval church, the Bible prophesies that for 1260 years, the medieval church would rule this kingdom after Rome's implosion. But there would come an end of that rule. It's actually prophesied. The timeline has a starting point and an ending point. It ends late in the 1700s, which is about the time we see America coming on the scene. The first beast receives a deadly wound and is led into captivity. And about the same time that the medieval church is losing its grip on learning and society and civilization, we see America rising in this sparsely populated place. And how does this power arise? It was coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. Now notice on these horns there are no crowns. When we saw the seven-headed beast with ten horns, we see crowns. This dynamic represents a ruling power. When you read about horns in the Old Testament, it, it often is a symbol representing a, a uh, intensification and a coming together of power and authority. But these horns don't have crowns on them. This will be a different kind of country. It's going to rule without the kind of dictatorship that most countries experience throughout their history. And indeed, our country is described in the book of Revelation. It comes on the scene very late in the history of man. It represents a completely different type of governance. And people have freedoms here that they never had in any time prior to the experience of the United States of America. Now, with little exceptions here and there, and certainly in the nation of Israel, there was freedom to choose to serve or not serve God. God said, choose ye this day whether you'll serve me. So coming up out of the earth, he had two horns, and he does something unique. For a period of his existence, he speaks like a lamb. He is indeed the one who's willing to sacrifice and serve. He is the epitome of goodness. But eventually, he speaks differently. He speaks like the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. And unfortunately, friends, this is where we see the world with its emphasis on nationalism and tribalism, the degradation of society, the rot of culture. We are headed towards a period of time in which authoritarianism will be introduced to reestablish civility on the face of the planet. How does a nation speak? It speaks through its laws. Our laws provide freedoms. If I want to stand up here tonight and talk freely about my religious convictions, I can do that. If you want to come to this church tonight, you have the freedom to do that. In some places, no such freedom exists. If we want to sing our lungs out to where they can hear us, driving down M139, we can do that. In some countries, they don't dare sing because it would give away the fact that they're worshiping God and the state religion is not Christianity and they could lose their life for it. He exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What I need to explain to you tonight, which I will establish in fact as we go through the series, is that the medieval church ruled with both religious and civil authority. That authority was taken away from it when Napoleon uh, jailed the leader of the medieval church. And for the last 200 years, enlightenment theory and rational thought has ruled in the leading governments of the world. But that wound which limited the effect of the medieval church's power to exercise authority over our conscience, that wound the Bible describes is being and will be healed. And when it is healed, this nation will speak like that phase of history and our freedoms will not be enshrined in law. Law will be reversed and the great principles that have guided this nation for so long and made it a beautiful light and city set on a hill will be rescinded. 
It goes so far as to say that he will perform signs so that even he makes fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And last night it explained on Mount Carmel, fire coming down was evidence of God's presence in the midst of this showdown between Elijah and the false prophets. And of course, the original sacrifices in the Bible were ignited by God's presence. He came down and he lit the sacrifice. And once that sacrifice was lit, they were careful to protect that fire and take it with them wherever they went. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. In other words, when there is this radical return to religion, we will see a manifestation of spiritual power that will overwhelm the senses of the Western world. You know, there are places in this world where they know the demons exist. There are places in this world where they know there's spiritual battles going on. But in America, we've pretty much relegated that either to the occult and spiritualism and seances or it's all make-believe. But the truth of the matter is, is that there will be angels, evil and good, vying for the allegiance of man as earth comes in for the final showdown between light and darkness, truth and error. And that showdown ought to be understood because there is a preparation that we can make for it. What is the image to the beast? It is a, an image is a likeness. So what we will see is there will be a reoccurrence of this phenomena. Church and state will reunite to enforce religious practices. Now you say, that is bizarre. It just could never happen in America. I can remember 25 years ago when I explained this to my father. And he said to himself, and he said to me, in effect, because I don't remember the actual words, I don't see how that could ever happen. But I want to tell you today, before I'm done, you're going to see how not only it could happen, but I'm going to show you how the introductory reinstitution of credibility for some of these questionable systems, systems that have compelled men's consciences, I'm going to show you how the world is not only trending, but will someday soon clamor for the kind of stability that religious direction can bring. You see, the churches of America and the Western world and the rest of the world should be calibrating the conscience of society, but instead they have found it easier to stay in business and to take care of patting their pockets by treating you the way you want to be treated, not the way a father would treat his children or a mother, her erring child. Spiritual decline, natural disasters, social chaos, and economic difficulties are going to lead up to this church and state union. It's not going to be a hostile takeover. The world is going to look for those happy days again. We sing about it, but we're, going to, we're, we're watching it slip through our fingers. How many children can grow up without responsible parents? How many places can you go where you worry whether or not the person driving the opposite way on the highway is hazed by this substance or by that? We're headed towards a point in time in which the world is going to clamor for a sense of self-control. And the best place for self-control to come from are the convictions of God. The problem is when they're reinforced by the state, they're no longer convictions of person, they're convictions of law. And that's not enough to change a culture. That's not enough to really change a nation. He performs these great signs, even making fire come down in the sight of men. And the result is deception. Remember, friends, if they say he's in the desert, don't go look. When somebody starts describing to you some amazing miracle, make sure that the fruits of this individual's life go along with the Bible because evil miracles performed by evil angels demons masquerading as angels of light, the Bible says, will have that power. It's restrained right now, but it's going to come out in the open and the world's going to be focused on spiritual agendas. It's by the signs. They're spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth. We are ripening ourselves for deception by our emphasis on only believing if we see it to gather the whole of them to the great day of God Almighty. So how can you tell the difference between a true and a false revival? How are you going to know if that miracle is emanating, if it's originating from God or from the evil one? Well, the Scriptures are clear on this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now listen, you should, you should recognize some similarities between something I said 
over the last few nights and something I've said right now. In John chapter 7, verse 17, it says, If any man wills to do my will, he shall know the doctrine, whether I speak for God or whether I'm speaking for myself. Now I've got you on a track in Matthew chapter 7, not John 7. That was John 7, 17. Now I've got us on a track at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about the same thing. If we're obedient to the principles and the precepts of the Word of God. He says at the end of his sermon, many will say to me in that day, Lord, we've, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. It appears that the devil is ready and willing to cooperate with those who come in the name of religion who want to have a spiritual high and don't even know along the way that they've been hijacked by a different spirit than the Holy One. But obedience to the Word of God, a submissive spirit, a humility to the presence of the inspired Word is an important thing. Evidence is found in obedience. And tonight, friends, it's not just that. Obedience prepares oneself for the truth. There are 10 things about this second beast in Revelation chapter 13 that's important to note. He comes up out of the earth. He has two horns with no crowns. He's lamb-like for a time. He speaks eventually as a dragon, and he has all the authority of previous chapters of earth's history where church and state are combined. Worship is the issue. He performs signs and wonders. He eclipses even the Word of God. In other words, his authority becomes above the Word of God. And he directs that an image to the beast should be made. Now, I'll talk about that later in the series. And eventually, he becomes a persecuting power, which is exactly what every nation has done that combines religion and civil governance. Now, I want to give you just a brief lesson in American history so nobody comes away without realizing the needle is moving. They said in England 300 years ago, harry them out or hang them. They were hunted and persecuted, imprisoned. They could discern in the future no promise of better days and many yielded to the conviction that for such as would serve God according to the dictates of their conscience, England was ceasing forever to be a habitable place. What am I doing? I'm reminding you of how America got going. Why people would risk a uh, uh, several month long journey across an ocean at the end of a summer into a late fall and arrive in an early winter almost. Indeed, they paid for their religious liberty sometimes with their life. And when God had seen pointing them across the sea to a land where they might find for themselves a state and leave to their children a precious heritage of religious liberty, they said, let's go. And so crossing the ocean many of them sick and dying on the way and more that would die afterwards, they found themselves in this land where nobody told them how they would worship. Friends, this is a unique phenomena in the history of man. When Nebuchadnezzar finds out that the image has gold, silver, brass, and iron, the next chapter in the book of Daniel has an image of the, probably the very exact same dimensions that's all gold, and you've got to worship it. The truth of the matter is, is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with all due proper respect to the king, said, we serve a higher power, and we would rather die than lose the liberty of conscience and the freedom of soul that you want from us, King Nebuchadnezzar. They were thrown in a fiery furnace, and Jesus walked in the fire with them. And friends, you need to know something. The stories in the Bible are going to be superseded in significance and power and glory for a witness to a lost world before Jesus comes again. And I don't know who might be listening here to me tonight who will find themselves like a modern-day Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing true for God, unafraid, or in a lion's den like the old man Daniel. But they will find a God who can deliver. They will know their God is real, and liberty is more dear to them than life itself. Liberty of conscience. Very few, even of the foremost thinkers and moralists of the 17th century, had any just conception of the grand principle, the outgrowth of the New Testament, which acknowledged God as the sole judge of human faith. But there was one who did. His name was Roger Williams. And if you're not familiar with this story, spend less time on the internet learning about insignificant things and watch a good video too on Roger Williams. He suffered even in America to establish this. But you need to know we are here today 
experiencing religious liberty because of his suffering. Every man should have liberty to worship God according to the light of his own conscience. And it finally codified itself into our original documents. No law respecting the establishment religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What happened in Rome, which was a republic in the Roman Republic, Gibbon tells in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Under a democratic government, the citizens exercise the powers of sovereignty. That's right. You should vote. You should understand that your engagement in civic society is important to the culture. And those powers will first be abused. In other words, when the electric finds, the electric finds out they can get what they want by voting certain ways, and the leaders all figure out to give the people what they want without ever any leadership or iron sharpening iron, eventually you end up in a demise of a republic or a democratic society. So those powers will first be abused and afterwards lost if they're committed to an unwieldy multitude. What would constitute an unwieldy multitude? It would be a group of people whose collective soul and societal conscience was not kept true about duty and valor and courage and honesty and all those things that allow people to govern themselves. When you lose those things, you can no longer govern yourself. You must be governed by external law. And while external law does matter, it does never replace the value of a soul who under the power of the Holy Spirit can say no to itself. Gibbon will go on to say, if all the barbarian conquerors had been annihilated in the same hour, remember Rome fell, it imploded. They came and they just started eating away at it from the outside. It lost its soul, it lost its vigor, it lost its courage, it lost its strength. But if all the barbarian conquerors had been destroyed in the same hour, their total destruction would not have restored the empire of the West. This is not a religious man. This is probably the most famous historian of the fall of Rome. And if Rome still survived, she survived the loss of freedom, of virtue, and of honor. De Tocqueville, Alex de Tocqueville was smitten with the American experiment. He came here to America and he studied our governance, our people. He he once made, uh, at least some have suggested he made it. Now I've put this up so that you know, many of the historians say it was a fraud, but whether it was a fraud or not, many presidents and leaders have quoted, and tonight I'm going to share it with you because it's at least a part of the legend and lore of America, and it's true even if he didn't say it. He said, America is great because America is good. And when America ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. Now, I want you to think about this. If you were living in Germany, no offense to anyone else around the world, but if you were living in Germany in 1945, you were desperate that the Americans would liberate you, not the Russians. Because the Americans didn't rape and pillage They brought candy for the kids. They had compassion. They didn't come with a load of resentment from smoldering centuries of of war and evil surmising. The Americans arrived in Europe sacrificing for the sake of freedom. I have stood on the grounds of the cemetery in Normandy and I've stood in the cupola where it shows America sending its live soldiers to France and the mothers of France sending back the dead spirits, not that I believe in dead spirits, but sending back the dead spirits of the sacrificed sons of America. I want to tell you, I'm awfully proud to be an American and I respect whatever citizenry you hold, but tonight you're in a country that represents the the dignity of the human conscience and the freedom of the human soul because they recognize nature's God and the laws that gave inalienable rights to human beings because they were made in the image of God. But they chose not to force you to any form of religion. Manifest destiny has been a phrase and a concept associated with America, especially the expansion West. It was the idea that America was to fill the world with good. It was take the message of its governance and its God to the rest of the world. And when you stand at the base of some of these trees in our national parks, when you go to its monuments and you realize what an amazing journey the Americans have had and the sacrifices they've made to make this world more safe and more secure, you have to be very, very proud. But there have been moments when perhaps the pride is not there. You see, friends, 
Our liberties have turned into licentiousness, and we have lost so much of what is made as good. We don't really tell the truth. This is from Harper's Weekly, which was the equivalent of time in its day. I want you to see America was a Protestant nation that was concerned that Romanism would find its way back into the culture and the society and the laws. And this was not a cartoon that was hidden away in some, uh, you know, back storage room in some slightly uh, uh, limited circulation periodical. Uh, if you notice the artwork, it, it has a serious concern, a fatherly protection, lest the old world with its combination of church and state should find its way in to destroy the future of the children. But I want you to understand, for the last 50 years, there has been a fairly steady push towards a different form of society and governance. John Stott, advisor to the World Council of Churches, said, the visible unity of all professing Christians should be our goal. I want you to know there are hundreds, yea, thousands of different Protestant denominations. Why? Because they have the freedom to believe what they want to believe about the Bible. And yes, religion has found its way into many conflicts. Does it change the fact that you still have a right to your own conscience, your own understanding of God, that you don't have to pray if you don't want to, and if you can, you can pray to anyone you want to? As a Bible-believing Christian, I might disagree with you about who you're praying to and what you believe, but I don't disagree with the fact that you have a right. Evangelicals should join others in the Church of England in working towards full communion with the Catholic Church. This was coming from the leader of the Church of England. We found a holy alliance in the 1980s to bring down communism. After that, we find an ambassadorship to the Vatican Sea, Never before in the history of America. We go beyond that and we find Protestant leaders saying things like this. In the regulation of belief or church activities, it does not mean that our beliefs cannot be legislated. Wipe the phrase, this is what I want you to notice, wipe the phrase of separation of church and state out of your vocabulary. Wouldn't our founding fathers die to hear this said. The problem is it's being said because religion has been so far removed from the practical side of American lives that we have an implosion of character collectively. The wall of separation in church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. This is a former Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. It frankly, it should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. This is not someone who was not tremendously respected. But I want to tell you, friends, there is continued pressure on. Just a few years ago, as we were celebrating the 500-year anniversary of the Protestant Resolute Reformation, we find all kinds of churches pressing together, some apologizing for the Reformation, some embarrassed about the work of Martin Luther, as if somehow he was responsible for the great schism and it was a big mistake. And if we go just a bit farther, we find the Pope addressing uh, the United States Congress in an act that was absolutely unprecedented. But of course, both men sitting behind him were active Catholics, nothing wrong with that. But once we start putting religious leaders in these positions and these posts, these pulpits as it were, which are really legislative desk, once we start doing that, we are seeing privilege and prerogative go to some who are religious that is not provided to others. And when we know that the Bible says the first beast will find itself wounded, for a moment in time, church and state will no longer rule the day. And during that period of time, religious liberty will burst forth in this new nation. When we see this kind of thing happening, the admonition of Revelation 13 that the wound will be healed is evidence right before our very eyes. When the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy and an infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. You say, Ron, you're going pretty far out on a limb. You betcha I'm going out on a limb, but I'm not quite done. I want to point something out to you. In the last two days, some pretty stupendous political things are going on. This I took just off a report from, a, from a, uh, an MS, from an NBC news feed from London. 
And it was yesterday's news or this morning's. I'm not sure. I didn't have time to check and see. Actually, it says on there, it's the 24th. So it's yesterday's news. I just want you to notice that across the bottom, it says the UK Supreme Court says Johnson's suspension of parliament was unlawful. Well, what was that about? Well, the newly elected prime minister, who some are predicting may be the shortest serving prime minister in the history of the nation, is accused of lying to the queen in order to suspend parliament. And it is surmised that his goal was to go around this body in order to achieve his Brexit deal. Now, whether or not those things are all true, what you need to understand is that what the pundits are saying across a variety of outlets is that this is the greatest political crisis to face Great Britain, some have said in the last century. I heard one today say since 1944 or 45. And of course, we know what was going on in the middle 1940s. The truth of the matter is, this nation is stuck. It can't get out. It's not really in. What am I talking about? The European Union. Those feet, partly strong and partly weak. That iron mingled with clay. It appears that they're stuck in the middle of limbo land. And he's guilty according to 11 to a 0 vote by the Supreme Court of Great Britain. Why do I bring this up to you? I'll tell you in just a minute. And how about the news for our own president? I'm not here to be political. I'm not here to say he's guilty. But what I am here to say is, while the Democrats have waited for months deciding whether or not they should make a run at impeachment, this last little bit of the whistleblowing news has moved them. Now listen, whistleblowing is a unique phenomena. It certainly has a glass ceiling on the upward mobility of your future career. But you need to know in American government, there is a proper and legal way to go about it, and there's an improper way. What you should know, at least about this event, is that a proper channel was followed, and they went to the inspector general. And after the inspector general examines it, eventually it makes its way to Congress. And the question at hand, of course, if you listen to any little bit of news, is whether or not there was a quid pro quo. In other words, a deal. You do this for me, I'll do that for you. Was there actually a request to look for dirt on a 2020 pres presidential candidate? I don't know if he did it or not. I'm not impugning him as guilty, but I am here to make a point about both of these men. I wish it was as simple as this modern headline says, Trump and Johnson together on the world stage, I troubles back home. I wish it was as simple as just eyeing troubles back home, like they could go back home and push a few buttons or move a few levers and it could be fixed. For the first time in my lifetime, the two leaders of the most prominent democracies in the world, I didn't say the biggest democracies, but the most prominent, and allies at that, both have political leaders whose credibility is highly compromised and their political ability to lead might be at its lowest moment. And you say, well, so? That's the ebb and flow of politics. Well, I want to contrast it against this. Just the other day, uh, the Pope was making an appeal. He references to his encyclical Laudato Si. And by the way, if you haven't watched uh, the news feed from Doug Batchelor, I encourage you to get online and do it. But this is the encyclical in which one of the things addressed is global warming and the need to reestablish a sense of order and peace and civility in the world. It's in this encyclical, which was at its five-year anniversary just a few days ago, that there's also a reference to the reestablishment of a day of rest, a Sunday day of rest that would be good for the environment and, of course, good for families. And if you're not aware of it, we have ourselves in a world today where even modern industrialized nations have been reinstituting Sunday laws, Germany being the most preeminent, Poland being probably one of the last to do it. And these are not old developments. They are relatively new. And I want you to notice the words. All I did was watch the video and take some screenshots, but I want you to see the words he's emphasizing. I would like these three words, key words, honesty, courage, and responsibility. He emphasizes those probably at least three times in about a three to five minute speech. The current situation of environmental degradation is linked to the human, ethical, and social degradation. I want you to start thinking about how much those words encompass. 
I want you to stop and say, maybe we're not in an age where it's business as usual. We are facing a challenge of civilization. He's talking to a global audience. And we need to act in favor of the common good. Now, I want to tell you something. Aside from the infighting in the Catholic Church, and there is, whenever you have an organization of any size, there are some who feel that he's totally letting the standards of the Catholic Church down. But you need to understand something. Amongst the masses, he still retains a credibility that some of the political world leaders are watching flow through their hands like water. And when he talks about courage and responsibility and honesty. He's touching on the issues of influence and credibility. This very same religious leader has established a date of May 14, 2020, in which he is going around and potentially including the political leaders of the world. But on May 14, 2020, he's calling the leaders. He's going directly to the people. He's calling the the sportsmen and the businessmen and all these people. He's calling them to Rome for a re-education, a summit on re-educating ourselves to the needs of the civilized world. Listen, friends, we are living in unprecedented times. We have democracies with we might say, hamstrung political leaders, stuck, not sure which way to go. Are they going to jail or are they going on to future terms and re-elections? I don't know. I'm not saying it's an implosion at the moment, but I am saying this to you. In the last 50 years, I'm not sure, and especially the last 30 or 40, as I've been old enough to observe, I don't believe we've ever been in a moment where the two leading democracies of the world find themselves politically as compromised as ours right now. Gridlock. Do you know what the White House spokesman is saying about this latest accusation and this potential impeachment? It pretty much kills all bipartisan uh, functioning for the rest of this term. I don't know if it's a threat. It's probably a reality. But what I'm saying to you, we've run into gridlock. And we might be in a unique moment where somebody's going to start rising above the lack of of ethical values as a leader, and it might be time for us to realize it's not business as usual. The climate crisis is not just an environmental issue. It's a challenge of civilization in favor of the common good. Our dialogue has changed. It's no longer climate change. It's climate crisis. It's climate chaos. Don't miss the verbiage. It makes a huge difference. What's going on in this civilized world, which some believe is marching towards an implosion of its own excess, is a call to others to say, we need to stop and regulate the human experience. How are we going to do that? You may never have seen this either. It'd be worth you going to have a look at. I watched it this morning, thanks to Pastor Michael. There's probably 15 religious leaders, all of different faiths. And the only real message they have is, we need to Embrace the common good and like each other and be nice to each other and make friends. The ecumenical movement, which is a large turn that means denying our differences, engaging our commonality, the ecumenical movement, the religious ecumenical movement is fueled. You might say it's on steroids. And if you were to give the earth a common crisis, if we were to find ourselves without the joys of 3 point some percent unemployment, if we were to find ourselves in a different world, we would see that indeed there would be an even greater call to come together. Global issues are what we are facing. Now I'm going to end with this. In the 1880s, there was a book put out by the, I don't know, probably the Review and Herald called Bible Readings for the Home Circle. And in the book, there are three cartoons. And as you can see, this is a chess game. In the background is a good angel. On the left is Satan. On the right is a Christian. It's the game in progress. Now I want to show you what happens if the Christian wins. The devil disappears. He's gone. The angel's happy. But I want to show you what happens if the Christian loses. It looks to me like Jesus in the background. 
You see, life is not a game. Life is a precious privilege. And I want to remind you that we hold these rights to be inalienable. We were made in the image of God. It's nature's God, and thus it's the laws of nature's God which must shape our homes, our schools, and our societies. But it is the collective but individual choices of America that have made us great. When America ceases to be good, I think we're seeing that she ceases to be great. Yes, we want God to bless America. I certainly do. And yes, we should pray for our leaders. Again, my speech is not political for the left or the right tonight. Do not misconstrue my words. My speech is to remind you whether you lean this way or that way, democracy is on the rocks because people don't tell the truth, because they don't keep their word, because they are selfish and uncontrolled, because people take bribes, and because people hide and are deceptive about things that should be out in the open and above board. People don't keep their promises. One of the reasons America has worked so well is that it used to be you could shake hands and that was good enough. Now 10 reams of legal paper might not be enough to get the deal done and give assurance to the person on the other side. Friends, America is not our home. Not in permanence. It is a great and glorious land which I could hope will rise again to its greatness by the internal character that collectively has made us a beautiful and redeeming people. Jesus is going to provide a bridge from this world to the next. That spiritual Jordan we have to cross, we're going to cross it with Jesus. There is nothing to be afraid of, not for a moment. He put bread on the ground every day for 40 years for the Israelites. He made water come out of dry, dusty flint and granite. He made a way through the Red Sea. He kept Daniel safe from the jaws of the lion. Ten plagues fell on the nation of Egypt. Only the first few fell in Goshen so that the Israelites could know something was going on. The last seven did not touch them. And God is going to do more for his remnant in the end than he did in the symbol form in earthly history. And tonight, the only thing that should matter to us is that we discover that we can be safe in the hands of Jesus, that we can be led to the rock that's higher than I. Jesus knows where we are every moment of the day and not a sparrow falls and not a hair from our head. Certainly not a heartbeat is missed or a breath lost unless Jesus decrees it to be so. And tonight, my caution to you is if you have made this world and this country or some other that espouses its value system, the ambition of your hopes cast them farther down throw your anchor across that Jordan land it on the other side safe in that heavenly land that new Jerusalem America has been like Jerusalem it has been a city set on a hill under its freedoms and with its economic might the glory of the gospel has gone all around the world there is still places for it to go we should work while it's day for the night will come in which no one can work. But friends, pray for your leaders. Be active in making this country strong and beautiful, but do not hang your hopes on living the American dream. For eventually, and we can see the signs, eventually the dream will become a nightmare. But not for those who have looked to a better country. Tonight, friends, I'm inviting you Jesus has paid the price. He's leading the way. There is nothing to be afraid of. And while this nation's glorious achievements will come to an end, that's where Jesus will step in and take us to a better place. Tonight, I'm appealing to you when you leave tonight, for those of you that do not have this book, it's called The Great Controversy. It was written over 100 years ago. It documents the slow demise of democracy. There's a chapter in here entitled America in Prophecy. If you have this book already, get it off the shelf and start reading it. Spend less time on Facebook. Do a little bit less on the sports field. Don't follow the stats of this person or that person. Turn off your television. A little bit less time on the iPhone. 
get this book back out and read it. It's an amazing read. If you already have the book, great. If you don't, I have about 70 copies that are sitting on tables when you leave this room. And if you don't care to pick up the book but you'd like to read the chapter I've referenced to, go to our Village Church webpage and it's posted there in a PDF format. Read it, friends. Pray before you do. Don't take my word. Let the Holy Spirit convict. Be willing to obey and follow Jesus and let Jesus be your teacher. I'm just a prompter. And may God guide you as you take advantage of your God-given freedom to figure out what truth is yourself. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus has said that he will never leave us or forsake us and he's going to take us all the way through. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we are not left wondering what's going on. Save us from worrying about what's going on. And may we set our heart on you and our minds on our heavenly inheritance. Thank you, Lord. There's a real heaven with your home there and a room for us in it. And I'm praying now, Lord, thank you that you've engraved us on the palms of your hands. Now, Lord, I pray, at what time we feel afraid, may we trust in you. And I pray, Lord, may your perfect love cast out any fear. Thank you for what we've had. May we look for something better. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Be sure to get your children. Be sure to get your book. Feel free to come over and get some food. And I hope you'll be back tomorrow night when I talk about the cornerstone of Bible prophecy. God bless you and have a good evening.